Welcome and good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at CSIS and Director of our Global Health Program. Um, we're here to discuss for the next hour and a half uh, the administration budget, the role of Congress, what may lie in store in terms of major institutional changes, the future of, of U.S. engagement in global health. Big subjects. Um, and judging from your presence here today on this beautiful evening, there seems to be an appetite in this town for this topic. So thank you all. Um, a special welcome to those who have traveled to Washington to participate in the Consortium of Universities for Global Health, the CUGH annual meetings. Uh, we timed this. We scheduled this session to coincide with the, uh, with the advent of the, of the meetings. And a special welcome to all of those who have joined us online. Uh, we, we have a considerable number of folks who've uh, chosen that path. We're webcasting this event, and we'll post it subsequently on the CSIS um, website. T today, earlier today, we posted a, uh, a really uh, incisive analysis by Ambassador Jimmy Coker on our website uh, that's relevant to these discussions here this evening. The title is HHS and Global Health in the second Obama administration. So please take a peek at that. That's on CSIS.org. Special thanks to my colleagues who've put so much work into organizing this. Joe Jordan, Chris Millard, Catherine Streifel, uh, Travis Hopkins, Alexander Bush, uh, Deju, Deji uh, Aluko. And on the CUGH side, I just want to emphasize how important CUGH has become in this town and what a great partner it is um, under the leadership of Keith Martin and, and, and uh, his colleagues, Dalal Kajar and others. They're very committed, um, they're very generous and hardworking, and we're very proud to partner with them and, and, and to be able to do a number of things together over the course of the meetings here. Uh, before we begin, a few, a few framing remarks, a few words on the moment that we are in just now. This is a dangerous and scary and highly uncertain moment. Um, but I also want to emphasize that it, it's a moment of mobilization. It's a moment of opportunity. The stresses that we're experiencing and witnessing right now uh, can result in some, in some uh, terrible outcomes that can, it can result in inspiring new thinking and new ideas and new levels of activism and initiatives. Um, I do believe, and I think we'll debate much of this in the course of the discussions, that we have to be quite vigilant and we have to be careful in understanding the bigger context in which these changes are unfolding and remain engaged and optimistic and realistic as we look forward. Um, the situation in both the executive and the Congress remains highly fluid and we had, need to think of it in those terms. Uh, I, in, my, in my feeling, uh, in my view, um, we, we shouldn't rush to categorical conclusions uh, in the midst of what is a very turbulent and unprecedented uh, uh, period of, of turbulence. Global health, development writ large, science and research and development, all of these face the biggest test in the 15 years that global health has grown, matured, been sustained, and shown remarkable results. Budgets reached heights in the naught decade that no one had anticipated. Ambitions soared, as did partnerships and as did the engagement by two successive presidents and, and a core of bipartisan support within Congress. That enterprise is now the focus of a populist assault by the current administration, which paints the global health agenda as antithetical to an American first agenda. The populist agenda grows out of a complex set of profound changes underway here in American society, which we're just dimly beginning to understand, just beginning to understand, I, I, I feel. And marginalization, poverty, globalization, stagnant wages, rising inequity. Uh, we really need to ask ourselves where that assault comes from as we consider how to defend what it is that we're here to discuss tonight, which is global health. Uh, we have somehow to make sense of what, what we're experiencing as a country uh, and to um, make one set of phenomena, which is in American society, not the enemy uh, of the other, which is the global health agenda, and in fact to somehow figure out a way to connect them logically and constructively. I don't know what I'm talking about, and I don't know how we do that. Um, uh, but, but I think we need to struggle with that question. Um, 
and you are in a position, I think, in American institutions, those of you in, uh, across this country, uh, to play a constructive role, to use your convening powers, uh, and, and to connect up to the sorts of domestic crises, the opioid epidemic being the most vivid uh, that are unfolding in front of us. But back to the global health agenda itself. We'll hear from our speakers tonight a lot about the evolution of budgets, what they portend, plans for institutional changes, what the administration is asserting, what and how Congress will play in this contest. We'll also hear a lot about what we do not know and what others are doing to mobilize, to shape discourse. This is an exceedingly busy, frenetic, and, and, and quick evolving context here in Washington. Um, the populist assault raises, as many, raises far more questions than we have answers for here today. There's considerable uncertainty of where and how this will evolve. Uh, don't expect clear and definitive answers tonight or tomorrow. Um, uh, we, we, it's quite likely that we'll see a, a series of struggles with an evolving and muddy quality to them that stretches out into the future. Um, assumptions around how serious and sustained is this assault by the administration, how coherent, how unified, how determined, those I don't think we have clear answers. And on the, on the side of Congress, uh, does it have the will, the capacity, and a consensus around creating a, 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 a series of actions that will defend, preserve, sustain? Um, many of you come from academic institutions. We really need to ask, and I hope we'll have more and hear more from you. Um, d does the consti academic constituency matter in this debate, and what, it, what can it do beyond what it's doing today um, in, that, um, in that regard? Um, I want to emphasize, you know, the global health uh, work um, uh, also draws from many other constituencies that are terribly important. Industry, faith, community, foundations, NGOs, um, and they figure in this uh, very profoundly. Um, enough from me. We've assembled here this evening the best and most insightful and most nuanced and deeply engaged of American observers, observers of both the administration and Congress. Um, we're, going, we're here to really hear from them, and we'll ask them to speak in, in sort of rapid order. Each is a close friend uh, of, of mine and of CSIS. Each has his or her special angle on these developments, and each has been very generous over the years uh, in sharing um, insights and support. Uh, we are a community here that is very reliant on our friends. So thanks to each of them for being with us this evening. We'll begin with Liz Schreyer, President and CEO of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, a remarkable network of advocates nationwide that has very successfully brought into the debate former cabinet-level foreign policy and international security leaders among the best in America, and, and they've turned them to the discussion of engaging Americans across the spectrum about why foreign aid matters and why they need to see it uh, in that context. They are positioned uh, remarkably well in order to understand, both understand what is happening, but also to be a an active player in a very constructive way in mobilizing action to shape the discourse. Uh, after Liz, we'll turn to Jennifer Cates, Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation. I'm sure Kaiser's familiar to all of you. It's, it's really the gold standard in, in, in data and analysis in the health sector domestically as well as internationally. Um, Jennifer brings an astute grasp of the budgetary situation of HIV advocacy and policy and programs in particular, and, and, and brings forward a constant stream of remarkably insightful analyses of complex issues, most notably re recently in the reimposition of the Mex Mexico City policy. Following Jennifer, we'll ask Chris Beyer to speak. It's, we felt it was terribly important at a gathering of this kind that we had someone like Chris here speaking from the vantage point of a major research university that's deeply committed in these issues. Um, and and, and I, I can think of no one better than Chris to fill that role. Um, although the board members from the CUGH shouldn't take offense when I say that. There's many, many other of you here that could come up and fill those, that, those shoes. Um, uh, he's a close friend. He's the Desmond Tutu Professor of Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's serving in the president of the International AIDS Society. Uh, he's simultaneously a, a gifted 
a field researcher, an advocate, an academic mentor, and a leader in the biomedical R&D field. And following that, we'll, we'll hear from them. We'll have a bit of, of, of conversation across uh, this group, and then we're going to move uh, uh, quickly to really hear from you. Uh, uh, people will bring microphones to you. Uh, we'll take uh, bundles, those of you who've been here uh, before, you know we, we try and collect quick, succinct interventions, four or five, and then we'll come back to our speakers. Um, it, it, we may run a little bit uh, slightly beyond 6.30 since we're getting uh, off to a slightly late start. So thank you all for being with us. Uh, it's, it's terrific to have you all here today, and a special thank you to those who've come from out of town for the CUGH gathering. So Liz, Jan, Chris, come on up, and we'll get started. So um, we're going to go in this sequence, Liz, Jen, Chris. Okay. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Um, thank you to start with because you've really been an extraordinary leader uh, in really transforming the way we all learn and think about, about global health. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks to every one of you. I agree for especially the the academics that have come in, and but everybody in the global health community for, for keeping all of us safer, better, and for being here today. And I'm gonna thank you ahead of time because I'm gonna conclude for what I need you to do <laughs> to be part of what is an enormous challenge. So a beginning thank you, not for what you have done, but for what you're going to do. So let me get in to the question that I've been asked to talk about, which is, the, uh, the budget in front of us. Um, and I'm going to start with this. And I thought about it today, this morning, as I was preparing, which is where I began two years ago. So two years ago, about this time, I began a journey of a program that the US Global Leadership Coalition, the organization I run, of a platform called Impact 2016. It's a platform that was set out with four co-chairs, Madeleine Albright, uh, Tom Ridge, two former secretaries, Democrat, Republican, and two former majority leaders, uh, Bill Frist and Tom Daschle, Democrat, Republican, to make sure that we went out and whomever was elected president of the United States, as well as congressional candidates, would embrace the idea that America should support development, global health, diplomacy, in order to keep our country safe, our economic interests, and our values. So I went out, along with my staff, for lots of, I won't go into all the tactics we use, but we met all 22 campaigns, most of the candidates, met with 160 congressional uh, uh, campaigns. And, um, and, and to be honest, I felt that the biggest challenge at, when I started would be um, Senator Rand Paul, who was running at the time and was a very strong candidate about two years ago at this time. And I thought that he, who was somebody who kept having amendments to cut foreign aid, would be our biggest challenge. Um, how wishful we might have been. Um, <laughs> And our goal was not Democrat or Republican, but on the eve of the election that I could go to sleep peacefully, thinking that whatever would happen, that, that the, those that would get elected would share the beliefs of all of us up on stage, all of us in this room, that all of these issues of global health, global development really mattered to America's interest. And we know the results, um, at least we'll talk about it on the presidential election. And the truth is that I woke up uncertain. There were some that called the president-elect all kinds of different thoughts about that. Was he an isolationist? Was he a minimalist? Was he a nativist? Was he just, as some have said, as you know, Steve Bannon said, the deconstructive of the administrative state? And the question, if you looked at November 9th, is that people really weren't sure of what this would mean to the agenda we're talking about today. And there were some early positive signs on the campaign trail. Our website would capture anything that the candidates would say. And on the few things that uh, then-candidate Trump said on these issues was on global health. 
And he actually had some positive things particularly to say about PEPFAR and about uh, fighting global uh, health and, glo and HIV AIDS. He uh, early on uh, picked uh, Vice President Pence, which on the one area on this arena that he cared about was on Pe uh, PEPFAR. He was an early supporter on it and picked people like uh, Dina Paul and, and Jim Mattis, people who had records of support on these issues. He then picked Secretary Tillerson, who as you know at ExxonMobil had a record of support and in investing in their foundation and women <clears throat> and girls and on malaria. So there were some, and was a board member for many years at CSIS. So lots of good signs. Now I run a budget coalition reality set in. Three weeks ago, I woke up to getting early signs of the following, that this budget was going to go after three things. Now, it actually went after lots of other things, but the headlines were EPA, we're going to cut EPA, we're going to cut State Department, and foreign assistance. Now, there's a lot of other things you can cut in the budget, but two of them hit right after what I focus on. They make up 1% of the budget. Now, there isn't any budget director worth their salt that would understand that State Department and Foreign Assistant, which makes up 1% of the budget, could balance their budget. So I thought, OK, this is not balancing the budget. This is political. This is political. So what does it say? And so let me get to the heart of what I want to say. 31% budget, <coughs> this, is a, this was a budget that includes a proposal of 31% cut to our State Department and USA ID budget. These are draconian, disproportionate budget cuts that have not been seen since pre-9-11 numbers. It would be, in terms of percentage of GDP, the lowest ever seen. Devastating, dangerous to our national security and our economic interest. Jen's going to go through it much more deeper in global health. But there weren't a lot of, this was this called the skinny budget. That means that the real, all the details don't come out to May. But what we do know is a few key things on global health. There are a few thing, things that seemingly priorities on global health. PEPFAR, they said, maintaining current commitments. That's not bad. Global health, funding maintained. On Gavi, sufficient resources to meet commitments. But there's a whole bunch that we don't know. And there's fundings on, uh, that we don't know on TB and maternal uh, and, child, uh, on ch and child health, vulnerable children. And we know the controversy that Jen will get into much more detail on family planning. So questions that I ask, how do you get to an age-free generation if you only are funding people who are in the pipeline right now? How do you eradicate polio? More concerning rumors, things that we don't know. When you look at the full budget, there's rumors that you, they might be cutting 75% out of development assistance, for example. So you ask yourself, can you run a PEPFAR program when you don't have the wraparound development assistance? There's rumors that they could be closing USAID missions. Again, you could have a PEPFAR program, but how do you do it if you don't have a USAID mission? There's rumors that UNN, UN, they would want to cut by 50% World Food Program. And I could go on. How do you end global poverty if that's something we really have if you cut at that level? So those are some of the really scary pieces. Let me end with a couple good news. <coughs> the good news, yes, there is some good news. I, I'm an optimist. Here's the good news. The good news is there is strong, deep, and meaningful support, <coughs> bipartisan support, on Capitol Hill. Within moments of this uh, budget proposal coming out, the first thing we heard is from Senator Lindsey Graham, who happens to chair the committee on it, dead on arrival, these budget cuts. But it wasn't just people who are normally say it. It was from people across the board who, uh, who are unlikely normally talk about these issues. Over and over and over again, I heard from members of Congress that we don't normally hear from who say these budget cuts are way too much for our interests in the world. And they said it over and over again. We saw it also from national support groups. We organized a letter from over 120 military leaders who said these are very dangerous. Letters of 100 
faith leaders from the evangelical conservative right community, community activism, and the significance of that matter. And they matter, and this is where you all come in. Remember I said thank you? This is the thank you part. So the thank you part is this. In budget wonky terms, I know all of you are here for global health. And Jen's going to talk about, I imagine, the good parts of global health, right? <laughs> some of the good parts. Um, and there's some good news, and there's some pieces that, as I said, we don't know. But you can have the global health piece, even if some of the parts come out OK, if the whole of the global development, and you don't have a State Department that functions, and you don't have a USAID, as Jimmy knows, that if you can't have the whole. And so the whole is we have to raise our voice. We, as a community, have to speak up. We have to tell our members of Congress, as private citizens, and in your academic as best you can to speak up and speak out. And that means there's wonky terms like 302B allocations that we can talk about when we get into. I won't do that yet. But it has to be a matter of making sure these allocations and these fundings matter. And I will conclude by this. They do matter. There is a congressman. He's on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Anybody here from Florida? No one in this whole room here is from Florida? I can't believe it. All right, nobody's grandmother lives in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> so when you visit your bed, ask everybody if you're representative, if your grandparents are represented by Ted Yoho. There is a congressman named Ted Yoho. Ted Yoho is on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He actually recently testified in front of the committee who appropriates the money for all the global health programs. And this is a quote from his testimony. He says, I'm going to read it so I get it right. I came to Congress, he has a, a kind of a thick accent, he says, I came to Congress to cut foreign aid. I campaigned to cut foreign aid. He, can, he admits he campaigned to cut foreign aid. He says, but I learned, I learned that cuts ultimately do nothing to address debt, but leave a vacuum of leadership. He is one of the best supporters of foreign aid. And I've traveled literally across this country, organized citizens like ourselves to speak out and talk about why global health makes a difference to our national security, our economic <coughs> interests, and our moral values. And what I have learned, I just spoke to a bunch of senators yesterday. I was invited to testify. And I have learned that when we speak out as American citizens, guess what? It's like we live in America. They actually listen every now and then. And so I just urge you that as you listen to my colleagues on this panel and you hear about you know, scary cuts that are here, they are real. This, is, this really is dangerous, as Steve said. And the only way this is going to get turned around is we speak up and to talk about the amazing work you're doing in your, acad in your academic work and research work and why it matters. And that is how we're going to turn around these dangerous cuts, because there are members of Congress that want to do the right thing. I've heard them. I've met them. I've listened to them. But they need to hear from us. And they, so that's my thank you, because I know you're all going to go home and make your call to your congressmen <laughs> and senators. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. <laughs> Jennifer Cates. Well, it's very hard to follow that. Um, but first, I just want to thank Steve. Um, as he mentioned, we've been partnering together for, for many, many years. And this is really just a continuation of a conversation that we, we are having um, about mm -hmm. global health and development. Um, and I want to welcome all of you, and thank you for being here. Liz and I did not coordinate on what we were going to, how we were going to approach our thoughts tonight. But I actually also went back and thought, what, what were we talking about a, a year ago? And actually, um, Steve and I were part of a, an event where we were looking ahead and sort of forecasting what was the future of U.S. global health policy. This was, you know, over a year ago. The campaigns were in full swing. Um, you know, we, we looked ahead and we, we looked at various data points. We looked at public opinion on global health. So where does the U.S. public sit? And we found through polls that we do, there was strong support. Um, the public sort of thinks of global health and development as, you know, good things that we do in the world. Um, wants us to play a role, wants us to have an outward facing connection to international issues and organizations. We did some research with um, uh, political elites, global health elites on the Hill and elsewhere, all of whom said, you know, this is one area of, of government that's had bipartisan support. It's been unusual. 
It's something that people care about and get. Um, we had a lot of different experts in the room at the time talking. So, so we looked ahead and we said, what, is, what, are we, what are we likely to see? And at the time, what we all said was, you know, it's been an unprecedented journey um, where we had gotten to with the increases that had happened. I mean, it's, it's truly remarkable. It's a story that we should all be proud of and can tell. Um, the increases in the budget, the, but really what that translated to was to saving millions of lives. I and mean, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, but we also recognize that times were tougher, um, that those increases were very unlikely to really happen. And I guess where we all came out, if I, if I can frame it right, and you can t let me know, Steve, if you agree, we felt that there, that, that there could be some changes and challenges ahead at the margins. That was really, I think, mm -hmm. where we felt we were going to head. There were going to mm -hmm. be some challenges at the margins. Um, there may be some s signs of a little bit of strain, some fissures that, that might start to show, but nothing major, no disruptions. Um, business would continue, we just might have some harder choices. Um, we did not expect that what we'd be facing was not changes at the margins, but potentially changes to the core. And I think that's where we are right now, and that's a question, an open question. Will there really be a fundamental change to the core of the role that the US government and other partners play in the world on global health and development or not? And I think we don't know the answer to that. Um, and as Liz has said, the administration, what, what we know now, at least on, from the White House side, they have signaled retrenchment, a move away from the world engagement, a specific call to reduce foreign aid, that has been very clear, um, and, a, and an emphasis really on, uh, in addition to America first and related to America first is defense. That's what we know. Um, on global health specifically, there's really not much else we, we have heard. There's been no announcement of any global health goals. Um, one could say that's early in an administration. We might not expect to see it, but there's been no real statement on that. But there are some data points we have, and that's what I was going to talk about. We have data points on the budget, and we have some data points on policy, policy decisions, and, pol and potential policy decisions. Um, one other thing that we, we, that's unknown, too, is a lot of the key positions that would, should be filled or will be filled on global health haven't been filled yet and in development. So that's a, an unknown at this point. So just looking and picking up from where um, Liz had talked about the budget, so this budget that came out three weeks ago, it really was a very top line budget. As expected, new administrations will come out with a very top line skinny budget. This was a little skinnier than most, <laughs> um, but it, it did talk very clearly about the intent to cut foreign aid, and we heard about the 31% cut, which is, you know, it's hard to um, grasp how enormous that is. Um, if you look at the, the, mo the biggest predictor of the future budget is the current budget. That's usually how it works. You know, and there's some changes, but that, this, this is a very different approach. Um, and uh, in the actual budget, it talked about refocusing economic and development assistance to countries of greatest strategic importance to the US and right-sizing funding across countries and sectors. There wasn't further information given about what that meant. And I think a lot of us are still trying to understand. Um, in fact, analysis that we just did looking at where the US provides its global health assistance found that almost 90% of US global health assistance is going to low and lower middle income countries. It's all going to places that need it the most. Sure, some of those countries are strategic, of strategic interest to the US. Some are just in need of help. So that's where the, the funding is going. That's where the programs are, 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 are being focused, largely matching the need. Um, and so we don't know what this realignment actually means. But despite some of the lack of detail that we talked about, there were some key phrases and things in there. PEPFAR was singled out. Um, PEPFAR was, it, at the budget said, provides sufficient resources to maintain current commitments, as um, Liz mentioned, which I, you know, everyone noticed. The Global Fund was singled out, the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And as uh, many of you probably know, PEPFAR and the Global Fund together are the uh, main uh, uh, programs in the world fighting HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, and so that was mentioned. Malaria programs were mentioned, again, supporting malaria programs and Gavi. Um, the budget also, and well, Chris will talk more about this, went on, though, to talk about cutting uh, NIH's budget by 18%, and many other cuts were, were um, mentioned. When this came out, there were um, lots of reactions to it, and everyone focused on the PEPFAR piece and the Global Fund piece and said, that's good, right? Um, I was in the camp of, I'm a, little, uh, I'm a little cautious, because I think the language is general and vague. Um, and others were, were very excited and thought it meant those programs would be protected. I think the, the way to look at it is they will be more protected than others. Um, and actually, what did subsequently happen 
Um, and this is, again, but the, this is the budget wonky stuff, so sorry about this, but in this, tucked away in this, in this skinny budget, was at the back, it said, oh, and by the way, for the current budget year, we want 18 billion more dollars to fund defense and to start to build the wall and do some other things. And we'll give you some more information about how we want that, how we're gonna get that money. Because you can't, you know, you need to, it's a zero sum game. That information came out just a couple weeks ago, and in that it was very clearly cuts to these programs. PEPFAR was, would be cut in this plan, um, TB funding would be cut, uh, malaria, uh, malaria wasn't actually identified, I, I have my list here. Um, TB, uh, neglected tropical diseases, nutrition, polio, global health security, family planning, um, and on the, I want to point out what, what it actually says. So some of these had justifications, why they, might, why they were being targeted for cuts. And on the PEPFAR one, it said, we will achieve savings by, quote, requiring PEPFAR to begin slowing the rate of new patients on treatment in fiscal year 17, um, as well as uh, reducing support to low-performing countries, reducing lower priority prevention programs, but to be slow the, uh, the rate of putting people in need of treatment on treatment. That is um, actually quite the opposite of the stated goal that the U.S. PEPFAR program has had and the global uh, approach has been. So that was, I think, interesting. Now, just to, to, to pick up something that, that Liz said that I think is very, very important to understand on the budget, why the budget is important for when it comes out from the president, and we'll get more detail in May, is this is a policy document. This is a stated document about policy and priorities mm -hmm. and how you make tough choices. That's always what the budget is. Congress plays the key role here. And as, as Liz meant, mentioned, what we've heard already from, from the moment this hit, um, hit the airwaves um, and the internet, this is DOA, we're gonna push back. But Congress is gonna have to push back on a lot because we're just talking about global health and development today. There's a lot in, this, in the budget that will be cut. So I think it's going to be a back and forth. Um, it's gonna be a tough one, but that's where things are on the budget. Um, and we can talk, we can come back to some of the detail. On policy, I wanna talk about three policies that we know, we, we've heard about or know of that are specific to global health. One is the Mexico City policy, the global gag rule. Um, this is a policy um, that was first put in place by President Reagan in 1984. And essentially, and it, people always get, get confused on this, so I just wanna say what it was designed to do. Up until that point in time, when the US doesn't fund abortion, so let's just, that's one fact. But up until that point in time, when the US would give money to organizations for family planning, there would be segregated accounts. So the US would give funding, and those organizations could get funding from wherever else and do what they wanted to do, what was legal in their country or what their other donors wanted them to do. As of 1984, a policy decision was made by Pre President Reagan at the time that could no longer be the case. And as a condition of receiving US family planning money, uh, any, any or, a foreign NGO that wanted to receive money from another source could not um, uh, support abortion-related activities, provide abortion, refer for abortion, uh, counsel on abortion, even in countries where it was legal, with other money. So that segregated account thing no longer would exist, and that was a condition of funding. That's called the Mexico City policy, sometimes called the global gag rule, because it also was about not referring and not counseling, not talking about abortion as a method of family planning. That policy is a ping pong between uh, presidential administrations based on party lines. Everyone expected when, President, when Trump got elected, we're gonna see Mexico City, it's gonna come back. That was not a big surprise. Day one, it was, it was announced. And actually, we all expected it would probably be day one. That's sort of the, the historical thing that happens. What wasn't expected was that the policy for the first time didn't just talk about family planning funding. It talked about all global health funding. Um, and some people read that as, well, that, that has to be a mistake. Um, all global health funding is, you know, million, billions of dollars and we've scaled up our, our global health efforts around the world, what does that actually mean? And actually the intent was to address all global health funding and say as a condition of receiving US global health assistance, none of the recipient organizations that were foreign NGOs could receive that assistance unless they certified they would not with other money um, perform abortion or um, do any abortion related activities. And it's spelled out in the policy. The details of how that will be implemented are not out yet in full. Um, they are out on the family planning side, but that is a big expansion of a prior policy way beyond what, what has ever been in place under uh, President Reagan, uh, both Bushes, um, and cer certainly was unexpected. Secondly, another expected policy that was just announced last week, um, there's been a, another longstanding um, issue, political issue, on funding for UNFPA. 
which is the UN specialized agency that does population, family planning, reproductive health, maternal health, actually a lot of refugee support. The US helped found UNFPA and has been a key supporter, but it too has been a political football. Um, and there's a provision in the law that's put in by Congress every year that allows the president to determine whether any organization could get US funding um, if, if they are determined to be involved in coercive abortion or involuntary um, sterilization. And this has been used to make determinations about UNFPA because UNFPA, I know I'm getting into a lot of detail, UNFPA operates a program in China. China has policies that are coercive population policies. Just in a nutshell, this determination was just made. UNFPA is not going to get any money in fiscal year 17 from the US government. Um, one of its biggest donors. The determination actually said in it, because it's a requirement that you, the government say to Congress why we're doing this, we did not find any evidence that UNFPA is directly doing this work. But because UNFPA is supporting the government, essentially, in China, it is, it is de facto supporting those policies. Just as a side note, UNFPA, like most UN entities, works with governments. That's how they, they work. So that, that, what, that policy, frankly, was expected, that decision, but that just happened. So that coupled with Mexico City, the UNFPA policy, and now um, proposed cuts to family planning, just together um, uh, paint a picture of we're, we're, we're changing our role, or there's a desire to change our role in family planning. The last policy thing I, I want to mention um, is just about the UN and international organizations. Um, there hasn't been a policy change per se, but there's been discussion about real, and it was mentioned in the budget, really um, retreating on our role in the United Nations system. And, that, you know, and, that, and the United Nations system has many different agencies and programs and offices. The US is one of the largest um, supporters of, those pro of many of those programs and their partners in, in many places around the world. But the idea is a, a very fundamental um, difference about whether the US government should be involved with those organizations. Um, so that's something that's pending. We don't know what that's going to look like. Um, there's a lot more we don't know than what we do know. Um, but one thing that I think Liz said that is really interesting to me as someone who watches this and, and, and is having these conversations, for the first time that I recall, the conversation in DC, the group of people that are talking about this is the broad development community. It's not just those who care about PEPFAR or those who are looking at um, global health security or those who are looking at family planning. It's those who are looking at development and understanding that it's knit together in a very broad sense that these programs operate in the same countries that have very, very great needs. Um, so I think that's a, a positive in terms of how people are, are reacting to it. Um, I'm going to stop there. I'm sure I probably uh, got too wonky with some of these details, but they're important details. Um, and, and I'm happy to share more as we, as we go on. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jennifer. <laughs> Chris Byer. Well, thanks, Steve. And let me join um, Jen and Liz in thanking you and, and CSIS for pulling this together. I think, I think just the response and the number of people who are here uh, underscores how much concern there is across our communities. And, and the, the timing of this is really very apt. So uh, we really appreciate your leadership and your, your convening. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about one of the core engines of innovation in global health and that is the biomedical research enterprise. Uh, and you've heard from these two very astute observers about the kinds of the real threats uh, of this moment to the global health enterprise. But there also, of course, are some real threats in these budgets and in these policy changes to the biomedical research enterprise, and in particular to that component of it, uh, which has really been the core of how our system has operated, which is National Institutes of Health funding to American researchers and research institutions. Uh, and I think uh, we, need to, we need to think about that uh, both from a kind of broad systems perspective, really understand how the system has worked and what it's generated, and think about the, the arguments that we need to make to the Congress and the American people uh, and to the administration in this very challenging moment. Um, so the first thing I think just to say, and I, I, looking around this audience, I know that I probably don't have to say this to virtually everyone in this room. The biomedical research enterprise is central to the success of the global health enterprise, right? It can seem rather distant, that basic science and that kind of work, but PEPFAR, for example, has achieved what it's achieved because antiviral agents are so effective, 
right? Uh, and antiviral agents and the regimens that we have now are the result of more than 800 clinical trials, almost entirely funded by the NIH and implemented either by U.S. universities or our global partners. And increasingly, more and more, it's been our global partners because that's where the enormous majority of HIV infections are, and of course it's where incidents, new infections are. Um, and so, for example, the, the support and the research infrastructure that the Fogarty International Center has been at the heart of, building that capacity with our international research partners is now a part of the biomedical infrastructure, and it's an essential part of it, right? It's very fundamental. The NIH is, of course, as, as I hope everyone here knows, uh, an American treasure. It is the largest biomedical investment in the public sector for any country. Uh, it plays essential roles in supporting this research enterprise. Uh, you heard already the, the proposed skinny budget was an 18% cut to the NIH. That is unprecedented. That is radical. In and of itself, it is unprecedented and it is <clears throat> radical. And we should understand that that is something very radical. Um, the subsequent 1.4 billion uh, suggested cut, oh, sorry, 1.2, well, still. <laughs> the 1.2 billion dollar cut to the current existing uh, budgets is again even more radical and really potentially devastating. I think the other point to say about those cuts, and I'm not going to talk too much more about the specifics of the budget, is just to say that in addition to being radical and unprecedented, they're very much out of step with where the Congress is and where the American people are. Right? So in the last administration, the very last uh, achievement, and certainly one of the major achievements of our last Congress, was the 21st Century Cures Act, a very large commitment, over six billion, uh, to basically cures and, the, and, and the, the research effort around those, including for things that the American people clearly want better treatment and hopefully cures for, like cancer, the moonshot for cancer, the Joe Biden, uh, Bo Biden uh, monies are there, Alzheimer's disease, a cure for HIV, a number of other really central elements. So I think we have to when we think about that threat and the scale of that threat to this research enterprise, also back up a little bit and think about how this system actually has worked and maybe make some arguments, hopefully some compelling arguments, about why sustained investment in it is such a good idea. So um, I've spent my career at Johns Hopkins University. Anybody heard of that place? And uh, we are a research university, right? And we're a teaching hospital and a teaching university. The medical school, the hospital, the school of public health, the school of nursing are consistently ranked in the very top tier of US research universities. We also are in the very top tier of recipients of NIH research dollars. Right? Those two things are highly correlated, right? And I'm not here to apologize for that. Right? Excellence in, uh, uh, in competing for these scarce NIH research dollars and mentoring and training young investigators to be able to compete in that very tough environment is a part of why our science is so extraordinary, and it's a part of why the clinical outcomes are so good, and it's a part of why Members of Congress, American people, if they have the opportunity and they have the misfortune to have a family member or themselves with a serious life-threatening illness, are so eager to be at research universities and teaching hospitals, right? Precisely because of that deep, tight, ongoing connection between research, clinical care, patient outcomes. Now, it is also true that, that part of the assault and this philosophical policy assault aimed at the research universities and the NIH enterprise appears to have some focus on uh, something that is hard often for the broader public to understand, and that is IDC, indirect cost recovery, right? So there is a, a, a clear, in this $1.2 billion cut, a suggestion that all of that cut could be made up simply by uh, going after indirect cost recovery. 
that is, uh, I think it's fair to say, a, a, both a misrepresentation of where the research dollars go and also a profound misunderstanding. So the first thing I think that drives that is a sense that this enterprise somehow is bloated or that the NIH has been expanding in the last number of years. So all of us who are in this work understand that that is not the case. What we have had all through the Obama years is essentially flat funding of the NIH, and that has meant real declines in purchasing power, as of course the cost of things has risen as it does. So it's not like we are dealing with some bloated bureaucracy. We have been dealing with very tough times where it's been hard to help junior investigators get independent research careers going precisely because the funding has been so restrained. So that argument somehow that, there, that this is this bloated, expansive system and that it's too big and it needs to be reduced is again not the case and also is a misrepresentation of where the Congress has been, see the 21st Century Cures Act, and where the American people are where there's consistent positive polling for biomedical research and for the kinds of work that we do. So how are we going to sustain this vital enterprise and do the research that we need to do and actually get to cures for Alzheimer's and breast cancer and HIV and diabetes and all the things that we all feel are so important? I think we need to do better at making arguments about what is really working and why this investment matters and why it is a part of what makes America, are you ready, great. <laughs> right? So here are a few, and I, here I must say that the, the recent piece in the New England Journal um, by, uh, by Katz uh, and colleagues really was a tremendous laying out of this argument if you haven't seen it. So first of all, of course, the most fundamental thing is improvements in health, in the health of Americans and in health globally. Um, great data on NIH outcomes, for example, reducing overall death from disease by 43% between basically the 1980s uh, and uh, 1970s, I should say, and 2013. Increased safety, and safety is hugely important, but also value. There are these value added arguments. So the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality of the NIH has done very careful assessments of this. And since 2010, they've reduced adverse events in hospitals and clinics by about three million overall. Um, that has saved 125,000 lives. And the estimate is it cost about half a billion dollars to do that. Does that sound expensive to you, to save that many lives, uh, but saved $28 billion. <coughs> so enormously cost saving, right? The research and development component is absolutely key. The NIH, for example, has played critical roles in the development of vaccines for cervical cancer. How wonderful is that? Hepatitis B, an enormous killer, both in the US, but particularly in developing countries, and the successful vaccine for Ebola. And by the way, none of those vaccines cause autism. Thank you. <laughs> She's not even a doctor, but <laughs> she got that right. And then, of course, there's the biosecurity argument. Right, so you've heard this argument that, for example, if you cut foreign assistance and the State Department so dramatically, we will, of course, need more military. Cutting these research dollars and reducing or, or eliminating Fogarty International Center and other players that are so important uh, in biosecurity is the classic example of penny wise and pound foolish. And in fact, there are people in the Congress, and a very important congressman, uh, Congressman Cole, who chairs the subcommittee on appropriations for health and human <laughs> services, who recently said, I would much rather that Ebola gets treated in Africa than in my district. Right? Yeah, good point. Also very expensive to do if we actually have to deal with an outbreak in the US. So I think the biosecurity argument is an incredibly important one. But let me make the last argument, which I think is really fundamental and not widely understood. And that is an argument about American competitiveness. Right? And this is why this is not just about money. And it's not just about the budget. Why is it that American science and American clinical research is so wonderful and so much better in many ways than our competitors? I think the answer to that is our system is better. Right? 
peer review, which is imperfect. It's kind of what, like what Ben Franklin said about democracy, right? It's the worst system ever designed except for all the others. So peer review is imperfect, but it's still the best thing that we have, right? NIH money is given out through a rigorous peer review system. And over these many years of flat funding, actually declining purchasing power, that has only gotten tougher. A tiny proportion of grants are funded, and an increasingly smaller proportion even gets scored because the resources have been so tight and the competition is so fierce. But also, that system really is remarkably free of things like corruption, political pressure, graft, undue influence from non-scientific players, right? So as an example, China, which seeks to compete with us and which would like to lead, Xi Jinping is in Mar-a-Lago as we speak, China has been unable to make safe infant formula. Right? They can't make safe pet food. And you have to ask yourself, so why is that? And the reason is, of course, that their regulatory bodies, the equivalent of their FDAs, are manipulatable. They are manipulated by political power. There are people at the top. It's who you know, not how good your science is. I have been an NIH-funded investigator, I'm happy to say, my entire career since I finished my training at Hopkins, 25 years. And in 25 years, never once has anybody who worked for the NIH ever said to me, if you gave me 25 grand of your grant, I could get you a better priority score. Never. <laughs> now, you ask the question of people trying to get grants funded in China <coughs> and in Russia and in India and working in that scientific system. Have you ever had political input? Have you ever had pressure? Have you ever had requests for money? And the answer, unfortunately, is a consistent yes. So our system is better. Our, our arbitration is better. Our peer review of science is better. And that is why virtually everyone seeks to publish in our scientific literature and why the best international researchers are also trying to compete with Fogarty grants and others through our system. And that is why the Food and Drug Administration provides a regulatory structure for planet Earth because everybody else who's seeking safety and quality knows that FDA approval really <coughs> does matter. And the approval of many other regulatory bodies is just too suspect to political manipulation. So I think when we, when we talk about the, 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 the power of our system, we also have to say this is one, uh, this again is an American treasure, and it's, it's a treasure of the administrative state. Right? This actually is how it works, and it has worked remarkably well. And I think we need to do a much better case of, of letting both the Congress and the American people understand that and embrace it and realize that it really is a part of our greatness. And it's one of the areas where America still leads, and it's a hugely important health and economic sector. I'm Thank you, Chris. Down. Now, we've reached 6 o'clock. Um, I want to offer a couple of thoughts that build on what we just heard, and then I, um, uh, I'd like to come back to our speakers for some quick responses, and then we're going to open things up. Um, my resp just a couple of quick thoughts. One is I, I, I think we need to here make special reference to the Fogarty International Center. Um, mm -hmm. It is one of the uh, NIH 27 institutes. Uh, in the blueprint budget, it was singled out to be eliminated. Um, so it is one of an array of <coughs> institutions, along with Woodrow Wilson Center, International Center, U.S. Institute of Peace, OPIC, TDA, uh, that have been uh, put up on a board as a, uh, as a symbol of uh, an institution that's truly antithetical to American First, and so it deserves to be eliminated. And so there's a, there's a logic of a kind of demonstration effect, ritual sacrifice, and the like. And uh, that uh, needs to stir a concerted reaction uh, uh, to, uh, to reverse that. Because by definition, these set off expectations and begin to create 
uh, a momentum, a, a stigmatization and a momentum. And um, this has special relevance to the community of people that are in this room mm -hmm. because um, uh, Fogarty International Center, its key constituency is, are the schools of public health in this country. And, and so uh, the danger to, in terms of damaging America's interest is in damaging the interests of those institutions here. And making the case becomes very important because it's a small institution. Uh, it has a, it, it does not have a, a deep footprint in all that many places. Um, and it's not all that well understood. And it's, but it is, it is by definition, its mission is by definition international and creating of human capacity and the like. So it, 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 it offends a strictly uh, fundamentalist populist sort of logic. Um, and I think that's one of the big challenges we face here today is to, is to try our best to, to overturn that and, um, uh, and, and make that special effort. Um, and that gets me to my second point, which is this is a very complex agenda that we've just heard from, mm -hmm. heard about mm -hmm. here. And it covers a span of programmatic areas, a span of institutional interests and the like. And it, and it by definition, is fragmented. Um, it's, it, it, it's possible to hive off different pieces. Mm -hmm. It's possible for it to get bogged down in explanations of the complexities of this. And it, and it makes it more difficult to come up with a unified message that's powerful mm -hmm. and that is il illustrated by a couple of powerful anecdotes, not 15 or 20 anecdotes and not 45 data points. Um, in other words, it has to be something that reaches a public that conveys this reality in a way that is not just us talking to ourselves, but talking to a broader universe. Um, and it has to be talking to a broader universe that is now bifurcated between two, two media systems broadly. I mean, that we have now a alt-right ecosystem that captures the attention of millions and millions of Americans every day. And whether you're looking at Breitbart or Infowars or Alex Jones, health and global health is on the radar and is a, is a component part of the, of the narrative there, and it's, it's not just confined to anti-vaccine, uh, it's, it's broader than that, far broader than that. So the messaging challenge is one that is different from what we thought we faced four years ago or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. The messaging challenge, not only do we have a populist assault, but we have a, a counterpart or a partner uh, ecosystem in the media that is playing its role in that. And that, that then translates back to us as to, well, what's the message strategy? How do you penetrate that and, 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 and move forward? So I'd like to ask all of you to just say a few words about the work that you do, which is really communications, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, particularly Liz and Jennifer. Um, you're out there trying to preserve credibility to preserve um, integrity of data, the confidence and trust of those who are receiving the message. Um, same thing plays itself through with some variation in mm -hmm. Chris's work. Mm -hmm. But you're in a universe that is a hell of a lot more difficult now as a consequence of what we see as this political phenomenon. Liz, can you say a few words? Absolutely. Look, it, it, it has to, we can talk about things that might, we all might understand, but it, to make these cuts meaningful to the policymakers that are going to make these decisions, it has to resonate out in Peoria, Illinois. And it has to make sense to their voters about why do we think on the global scale, uh, you know, I'm t I work in the global community, some of these issues are on, uh, on uh, matter here. It has to make sense to their voters. So how do you make sense of why does it matter to affect global health here and to their voters? So yesterday, I t so, it, so we talk about it from the national security arena. We talk about the economic, and we talk about moral. So I had five minutes yesterday to talk to 15 senators. Uh, and I thought, how do I want to use my, my time? So senators are fairly well educated. 
So I could have done a lot of numbers and a lot of time, but I thought, I'm going to use my time to talk about message, and message that would matter to their voters. So I said, you know, I want to talk about three numbers. And I talked about three numbers about message. And the first number I said was 20 million. 20 million is the number of people who are going to suffer from famine this year. And I talked about the four countries. And so not only was that about four countries, for 20 million people who are going to suffer from uh, horrific humanitarian uh, issues, but think about those four countries, Yemen, Somalia, South Sudan, and Nigeria, all four that harbor terrorists. And to think about not only from a humanitarian, but a national security. Then I went to the number 65 million. The number 65 million is the number of people who are displaced in this world. The largest number of people displaced in the world ever since World War II. If you cut it this nature, millions and millions of people will be go hungry, lose shelter, and think about the humanitarian impact that we'll have, and also the impact that we'll have on our strategic allies, such as Jordan. So again, a humanitarian and national security. And the last one that affects what we're talking about here is I use the number 320 million. Why did I pick that number? That's a number of Americans that are vulnerable to the next potential Ebola, pandemics that could affect us all here if we don't invest in global health systems around the world. And I end it with a story about that. So what my point is around message is that we have to find messages that tell the story about why does it matter to invest overseas that can matter to our own national security and economic and moral values. Thank you. Jennifer? Yeah, I, mean, I can't. Um, I mean, that's exactly what I would uh, uh, say something similar. One of the things we learned over the last eight years and longer is that there's not a single message that really works. Even, you know, two years ago when we have message conversations, say, well, some audiences it's the national security message. With other audiences it's the moral message. With some audiences it's, um, you know, you can appeal to, to economic interests. So it's, there is no single message. I think now we're just, we're facing an environment where there's a lot of noise and the traditional messages that have worked with, lot, with some of the key constituencies that are decision makers don't always work. So I think that strategy on the Hill is a really, really, is a good one. Um, other, the other thing on, on the Hill side that we um, also have to grapple with is uh, there are, on the one hand, there's just a few members who really focus on these, these, this stuff that we're all talking about. On the other hand, there's also um, a need to educate a whole new um, uh, set of actors. So uh, there are less than um, a third of current members in the Congress who were part of the first PEPFAR authorization. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's a, a, a set of individuals who just it weren't there at the time when some of these tough thinking around how do we you know, scale up, should we scale up, should we take on HIV in a big way, they weren't part of that discussion. And I think actually if they were, that was such an interesting moment where the ideas around moral um, leadership, strategic leadership, national security leadership, economic interests really came together because um, I've been asked this many times, I think Steve probably has too, why did President Bush do PEPFAR? You know, people want to know what was it? And my answer always, it wasn't one thing. There were many things that came together for that administration, people, ideas, mor morality that came together to lead to a PEPFAR. And I think those of us who were around at that time saw those things converging. I don't know how to translate that to the current moment, but I think a little, that, that's tr what we need to, to do, is to translate that mm -hmm. concept, fast forward to 2017, in this current moment. Well, one, you know, one answer mm -hmm. is to say, look, the, um, you can organize your response and your messaging against your adversary. Your adversary is a narrow, an extreme definition, populist definition of what is America first. Mm -hmm. That's what's coming at you. So if you, if you come back with saying, no, that's not what is truly America first, it is this. And I think that, and, and, and that means you care about these numbers. I like what Liz says where people listen when you encapsulate such a powerful dimension. of This is the world we live in. And, the notion of de-escalating or withdrawing or, 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 or agreeing to only go inward, it does get back to the other question, which is populism here is, is driven by disillusionment. 
internally. <coughs> it's not just some arbitrary thing that happened. It's something that happened within our society that led to a large population feeling marginalized, forgotten, left behind. And we don't speak to that population in our messaging either. It's very, it's difficult to, to think that through, but we don't, simply s s repeating, the, repeating the many uh, great reasons why liberal internationalism should motivate us is an important element, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't begin to square the circle on why is it that people are embracing this mm -hmm. in our society? Why was there a de decay of trust in public institutions? Uh, and why has there been this turn towards believing that this type of thing would be justifiable? When you look at the skinny budget, you know, one reaction would be, if you'd been shown that five years ago, you would have said, if this were put forward by the President of the United States, it would have ignited a, an, ex an explosion across this country. But it didn't. Right? I mean, it ignited a well, hell of a lot of activity. To, it gets or, to your point about the, the question of that there is a, lo there is a portion, they, they voted for this president, who really questioned have lost trust in institutions at large, and they lost trust certainly in government. Um, you know, a number of people in this room work for institutions, and if you poll and look at it, there are you know, a whole question of institutions. So there's two parts of your question, mm -hmm. is how do you message around you know, the, the commitment to global health, and how do you message around the commitment to global health through government? Mm -hmm. And so part of the challenge is, you, if you poll and you ask people, do you care about the poor in, you know, and the famines, people are, Americans are incredibly generous. And then if you ask them, well, do you want your government to be involved in that? That's a different question. And do you think the government is good at doing that? That's a different question. So why people want to, um, are co comfortable cutting some of this budget out, uh, it's because they don't trust the institution of being able to do it effectively. So we have a number of hurdles. We have a hurdle that we have to go and say, no, it is, it, we do need and want to help these people overseas that you don't know in their countries that you've never heard of their names to some degree. But we also have to convince them that these programs actually work and are effective and go back to something Jen said earlier, which is we've, you know, PEPFAR has saved 11 million lives. So there is a hurdle that I have seen I have been to focus groups where I have heard the moderator talk to people and say, do you think this would be a good program? And describes a program that work, the government is doing, has worked, has saved millions of lives. And I've seen people in the middle of Ohio or somewhere who are, who are less educated, less knowledgeable, and said, oh, that would be great, but I don't buy it. And it's happening. So that's one of our hurdles. Yeah. Chris? Yeah, I think. You know, certainly when you look at, at that PEPFAR time uh, and the messaging and, and, and uh, the, the sort of different strands that came together, certainly part of it is it was a unique coalition, right? And then the same thing really happened with 21st Century Cures. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting coalition of a lot of different players uh, coming together. So, uh, you know, there's, there was a very strong advocacy from the Alzheimer's community. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the, the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic. The moonshot on cancer from uh, Biden. There was, uh, and, uh, and, and that was successful, right? As the most recent PEPFAR reauthorization was successful. And, and on the very, very short list of bipartisan achievements uh, that, um, that 21st Century Cures really, really had an extraordinary array from, from both sides of the aisle. Um, I think those, to me, are examples of uh, both where the Congress is and, and the people they represent are on some of these critical issues. And that, that is a part of, certainly, when you think about the biomedical research enterprise, it's going to take a coalition, and a broad coalition, uh, to, to advocate for it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that somewhat the model is out there with, with both PEPFAR and 21st Century Cure. Jen, did you want to say anything? Let's open things up and take the next 15 or 20 minutes and hear from you. Uh, let's start, we'll start over here. We have three hands, Peter, and there's two hands there. Let's 
Start over there and we'll come to you. <coughs> we'll take four or five. Please identify yourself, be very succinct. Yeah, please. Peter Small from uh, Stony Brook University and a fellow here at CSIS. Mine is more of a call to action than a question, but building on Liz's uh, point about uh, hear, having your voice heard. How many people here are familiar with five calls? Raise your hand. Yeah, I'm gonna ask the rest of you to pull your phone out and download this app because it makes it incredibly easy to make a call on an issue that you care about. And I, do it now, pull out your phone, download this app, <laughs> <laughs> and start making calls and we get home, talk to your friends, talk to your students, and let's just blast them with phone calls. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Right, right here, Katie. Hi, thank you so much for the discussion. Um, given that, the, that you talked about like the impact of these budget cuts and also the importance of messaging, I would like to know what are your thoughts on the role uh, that you know, the academia and think tanks and, you know, global health professionals can play in getting this message, uh, messaging across to the public, the people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whose opinion holds a lot of sway, especially in populist governments. Thank you. Right here. Let's, let, right, can we bring a microphone, Dean? Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you all for your time and for being here. Um, there was a lot of discussion about messaging and, um, and biosecurity arguments made. Um, I'm just wondering, my thoughts are personally, there's a fine line between the biosecurity argument and the securitization of health. Um, and this is something that I'm grappling with with colleagues. Um, you know, if we continue to securitize health and sell global health, to the individuals that are gonna be funding it in this way. Do we not threaten uh, just looking at global health through a defense lens alone um, and not actually maybe in a moral or a scientific way? Thank you. And then uh, right behind you, Dean, there. Uh, Jonathan Patz, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Um, just to add on to that as far as different lenses, I'll just say that there's a big push for infrastructure investment, so I think it's really a good opportunity to talk about our rusting pipes under cities and in fact speaking of cities that populations are moving into cities and that's a great place to practice public health through an infrastructure lens could you just hand that over uh, tom bokey had had your name <coughs> great thank you um tom bokey council on foreign relations what i wanted to ask about is you all mentioned how global health has a strong tradition of bipartisanship and perhaps that's why some of these specific programs were named as being largely continued. And what I wanted to know is I think most people in the room would obviously support this objective. We want these programs protected. How do we have this conversation without making it partisan? Uh, politics have become very tribal. One worries uh, in terms of pushing this agenda, you wanna push it in a way where people don't feel obliged to, to back their guy in the White House. And obviously you have people like Senator Graham who's willing to exercise that independence, but that's not true for everyone. Thank you. Why don't we come on back to our, our speakers. Jen, you wanna sure. try, um, try your hand at a few of those? Yeah, so the question about securitization of health, I'll start with that one, because I, I, this is a, a common concern, right? Interestingly, um, that idea, the idea of, of talking about health from a, from a biosecurity or national security lens started a long time ago. And, um, and when it started, I, um, for those of us who were doing the work in, uh, some of this work in DC, I, th I think there was a level of discomfort about it. Um, and I, and I, I think that there are risks. At the same time, it's been an ongoing way in which for some, it's a way to talk about. It. I think the risks are if that's the only lens with which health is viewed, you're not always gonna make the right public health decisions, right? Um, I, you know, we, we did a big a study, and it's on our website on the DOD and health, global health, what the DOD does in global health. The DOD is an incredible global health enterprise that many people don't realize um, is involved in many aspects of global health, and it's, it's a quite a, a fascinating story. And it's doing great work, and it's partnering with NIH and all, all the um, programs we care about. Um, one of the challenges we identified, and this is from people working in that space at DOD, is that it's not a health entity. 
And so when the DOD approaches health issues, not, I'm not talking about individuals within the DOD who are medical doctors and get it, it just doesn't, it, the frame in which the DOD approaches health is different. So there is a potential risk. At the same time, there's amazing work that is being done. So I think it really comes back to different audiences, different ways to think about it, um, recognizing the disciplines are different, but going with my view, which is that it, this globalization of, of, our, of how we live in the world I think we can't think in very narrow disciplines either. We can't think of a public health as, as strictly in one narrow discipline. It's much broader than that. So that, that would be my response. Um, on the issue uh, that, that Tom brought up, so taking something that's quite bipartisan in nature, and if it gets pushed and there's a pushback, does that risk it becoming a partisan issue? Good question. I don't know the answer. I would just say that um, USGLC, the work that, that you're doing, has been very careful to show that the voices are very bipartisan. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan voices on this um, from many different sectors. So I think that's, that's the way to do it. It's really, it, isn't, it isn't about partisanship. Um, and I, I, you know, that there is going to be that risk. But um, ultimately, I think if you're a, a global health professional or development professional, you do that because it, it's what, what's right to do. Yeah. Liz, you want to jump in? I, I just pick out on the last one. You know, I, I spend a good deal of time with, with as much as I can with this administration and as people are filling in. And, and I, I agree, I think that um, you know, this administration is forming, as we know, and there's a lot of different pockets of players there. And um, we see in many different issues that there are multiple different voices. This budget is a, obviously a very, very big piece of their policy messaging, but I don't know if it's the only one yet. And I think that it's young, and I'm um, hopeful that there will be more opportunities for there to be more voices. Um, we have seen, as I said earlier, across the board, immediate reaction from both sides of the aisle. And what struck me so is I expected, I, I, I adore Lindsey Graham, I expected Lindsey Graham right out of the box to say these are, this is dead on, uh, dead on arrival. I expected people like Senator Marco Rubio who's been a champion on these issues to say it. I, I was quite pleased but also surprised when Mac Thornberry, for those of you who don't know him, he's the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, to be one of the first people out to say that these cuts aren't okay. I was pleased but surprised when the, speak, the, the majority leader of the Senate, M Mitch McConnell, to say very quickly, these aren't OK. So the, as Jen said, the bipartisan port was very quick. And I think it, it remains not just on global health, but on global development. So I think that what we are finding with this administration, where typically you have an administration of a party, where the party, particularly when they're both the Senate and the House's control, they kind of all stick together. We're seeing that the disruption, which I think this administration came to do, is changing that partisan balance on a lot of things. So I'm not finding that that in this case right now. So I'm not feeling that as an advocate who has lived and breathed for 35 years in the bipartisan space, I'm not uncomfortable with where we are right now. I would just add one comment that I, I would like to make on the first question. I think you are one of you as the academics and professionals are one of the most authentic validators to speak out. One of the things that this election taught us is authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're up here as professionals, at least Jen and I do this, and Steve probably, you're, you're, you're an actual academic. You, and, uh, so so you, you aren't as tainted as right. the rest of the three of us are. Um, but the rest of you actually count. And, and that's a good thing. So th this is a world today to get to that Peoria, Illinois, you know, voter is authenticity matters. So speak out, speak up, talk about why global health matters, talk about your research, talk about the connection, talk about it in a way that frankly is you know, less wonky than the way we probably are talking about it up here, that makes connections and think about how you can make connections. Write an op-ed. If you could get in front of press in your local papers, 
and make it count. If you travel overseas, come back and tell a story of a child you met, a family you met. Make it real and make it meaningful. And because if I do it, I'm supposed to do it. If you do it, it's a story. And I can't underscore it more. You make it real, and please do it. I would just, just build on that a little bit um, to say that uh, I know it's happening in many universities, it's certainly happening in ours, that um, very quickly uh, the dean of our school, the Bloomberg School, uh, asked us to form um, a policy ad hoc working group to, to work through many of these issues and one of the very first outcomes of that has been a 12-week intensive training in how to do just what Liz is calling for. You know, how do you, uh, writing op-eds, getting out in That's front great. of the media, uh, and, uh, and I, I did one early this morning uh, on testifying uh, and doing briefings for the Hill. It's, it's something some of us do, even we academics. Um, and, uh, and I think certainly we haven't been doing enough of it. Uh, I want to also build on the, the point about um, really trying to, uh, to maintain the bipartisanship and really address those issues that are, that are cutting across the aisle. Steve mentioned the opioid epidemic. Um, and uh, so, you know, overdose has now overtaken motor vehicle accidents uh, as, a, as a cause of death among young Americans. That is breathtaking. Uh, and we've seen, and there just was a further um, uh, elucidation and extension of the data on these measurable declines in, in life expectancy in white Americans, which is also breathtaking, because life expectancy is such a, such a careful, uh, such a sensitive indicator of overall well-being. And, uh, and the fact that it has been declining really speaks to people who've been left behind. Uh, and, and the enterprise that we really need to engage in, in, in doing better for those people uh, and, uh, and investigating those, those causes of death. I think overdose is one where there really is bipartisan support, um, and it certainly is, was not lost on this administration. Um, uh, Trump brought it up in lots and lots of campaign rallies, and he heard about it in many, many places where he was. Um, and it's, it's striking, you know, in, in, in my own state of Maryland, which is very close to where, uh, uh, where we are, um, we've had needle and syringe exchange and naloxone in inner city Baltimore, and it was not allowed in the county or in any other county in the state because injection drug use was perceived to be an inner city urban problem uh, where it's okay to do needle and syringe exchange, and we actually had city and state money to do that during the federal ban years. Um, but where the city has actually ended up being supporting the counties because drug users were coming into the city for those services, right? And we have really not paid attention to that, and we have not figured out how to deliver those services <coughs> to sparser rural populations where lots and lots of young people are dying. Um, and so I think that, that to me is a sort of paradigmatic example of a problem that, um, that where we, by responding to it, can really build, again, a new coalition uh, that is truly bipartisan. Thank you, Chris. We're at the end of our hour. I apologize. Many of you wanted to pose questions and that we don't have more time. Um, let's just close by asking our three speakers for just one last piece of, one last thought focused to a university community. We've heard some very focused comments from Liz and others here, but as we close, you know, what is it that gives you the most hope looking ahead in this period? Chris? Liz, go ahead. Well, I can do it easy. This, is this group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that you're all going to go. You're going to use the five call uh, and, and call your congressman and use your bully pulpit to, um, to, to raise your voice. This is very serious. It's, it's not just the budget cuts. The budget cuts are a, 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 a symbol of what Steve was talking about, which is there is a portion, fortunately, uh, there's a portion of this country that think it's okay for us to close the borders um, on global health, but on a range of issues. And we've got to raise our voice. And we have to educate, and we have to find the messages, and we have to push back. Um, but I am optimistic that if we do it, we can hold on to the programs that we know are right for this country. So I thank you. 
Thank you. Jennifer. I would just add that one of the things that has happened in the last decade that's made me optimistic, and I think continuing forward, is the number of young people in the university setting who uh, came out and said, I want to do global health. I want to do something in the world. It was kind of surprising mm -hmm. to all of us, mm -hmm. I think, doing this here. And that energy, which really was a marked shift, um, there was a discipline that was there, but they helped, I think, develop our discipline. That energy is what, what gives me a lot of hope and optimism. That's the next generation. Some of you are here. You work with them. I think it's younger um, scientists and researchers and students who get that this is a way to be in the world, and that gives me a lot of hope and optimism. Thank you. Chris, you get the uh, honor of <laughs> benediction here. <laughs> So the, go, thing that, go for it. the thing that really makes me the most optimistic is that our science is so spectacular and we are so on the edge of so many more incredible advances, right? And we've actually never known more about health. We've never known more about disease. We've never known more about the body. We've never known more about our genetics. Uh, and yet we're in this tough paradoxical place where the evidence is being disparaged and where there's less and less understanding in the public about what it is we're, we're doing and the successes we have. I think that at the end of the day, what's always led to the biggest advances and the best outcomes has been the scientific breakthroughs. And this is a golden age of biomedical investigation. It really, truly is. A lot of the people who've made that happen are in the room. Um, and, uh, and it can't be that we are going to retreat from these advances and making them real for people uh, at this critical juncture. We just can't let that happen. Uh, and I'm heartened by everybody in this room. And uh, I'm going to quote the great uh, poet, Allen Ginsberg. Um, America, we have to put our queer shoulder to the wheel. <laughs> Please. <laughs> that was a very good benediction, Chris. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and thanks special thanks to our speakers here.